where did the, the other 110 virgins come from? <coughs> and of course we don't know. They might have been Chantideva. Then they might not. But anyway, of course, we are following this version, which was the uh, version translated into Tibetan in the, um, probably first in the, the uh, 9th century, I think, and then again in the 11th century. So, this is not a very easy chapter. I mean, one might imagine a, a chapter on meditation is all about how to sit nicely and, and watch your breath. And that's not what this chapter is about. In Buddhism, the, all schools of Buddhism are concerned with how to deal with our negative emotions, our clinging, grasping, desirous mind towards what is pleasurable, and our anger, aversion, rejection side towards which is unpleasant. And all of this based on our fundamental misunderstanding of the way things really are, not only outside of ourselves, but also towards our own personal identity. <coughs> so the patience chapter in this uh, text in the Bodhicharya deals with how to deal with anger and aversion, especially concerning others and their behavior. And the next chapter, the ninth chapter <coughs> of wisdom is dealing with our fundamental ignorance, especially in regard to our own sense of identity, our own ego, which is the, the core problem. Because we don't see things how they really are, and we're very deluded, therefore we get caught up in all the other negative emotions too, this grasping of what we like and aversion towards what we don't like. This chapter, so one is dealing with the anger side, one is dealing with the delusion side, this meditation chapter is dealing with the desire grasping side. I think it's important to understand that because then you understand what he's saying. So we don't have endless time, so we should stop. Okay, so the chapter before, because uh, his previous chapters are going through what are called the paramita, uh, generosity and patience and ethics and efforts or diligence and then meditation and wisdom. These are qualities required in order to attain to Buddhahood. Buddhahood is never attained merely through intellectual um, analysis or merely through meditation, but many qualities of the heart need to be um, cultivated in order to reach the, the fullness of our true potential. So this chapter is mainly dealing with our, our desiring, craving side of the mind, which reaches out to grasp and hold on to that which we think is pleasure, will give us pleasure, especially other people. So, the previous chapter, therefore, was dealing with effort, enthusiasm, diligence, and so forth, because without those qualities, we are never going to make any progress in anything which we uh, desire to attain. I mean, any skill which we wish to acquire, we have to make some effort. We have to practice. Whether it's gymnastics or yoga or golf or learning a musical instrument or anything that we want to acquire um, facility with, we have to put in effort. So that was the last chapter. This chapter, he therefore says, having developed enthusiasm in this way, I should place my mind in concentration. For the man whose mind is distracted dwells between the fangs of disturbing conceptions, disturbing thoughts. Our main problem is that our mind is distracted. Um, we normally are not so conscious of how distracted we actually are until we try to concentrate. 
when people sit down to meditate, it is well known that the first reaction is that their mind is worse than it was before. More thoughts, more feelings. What's going wrong? Meditation is supposed to make us calm and then more caught up. But of course, as you must know, uh, this is always regarded as a good sign. It really <coughs> doesn't mean that we're actually manufacturing more thoughts. It's just we're becoming more aware of the problem. That we are endlessly talking to ourselves, endlessly chattering, endlessly caught up in the past, or anticipating the future, or just running around in the present with our opinions, ideas, and uh, you know, general chatter. It's like we have a television on in our head the whole time. And even if we're trying to concentrate on something else, that background noise is always there. And sometimes we're not even conscious of it until we sit quietly. Then suddenly we realize, my God, this television. <laughs> wow, going on with the usual junk that televisions go on with, you know, including all the advertisements. <laughs> and all the reruns of all the soap operas. <laughs> That's us. <clears throat> That's us. And so therefore, in order to really accomplish anything, step number one, we have to learn to bring our mind more single-pointed, to quiet the mind and get it more concentrated. So, but this is not what the chapter is about, sorry. <laughs> so, therefore, he is saying, the next part is about how to concentrate the mind. Because if we are in the middle of the marketplace with an untamed mind, then our minds are going to be totally <coughs> distracted. Therefore, it makes sense, at least when we are beginners, that we remove ourselves from the marketplace. <coughs> we go to somewhere which outwardly is quiet and calm, and that can help us to reflect and gain a more inner silence and calm. It just helps. It does help. And so this is what he's going to be advising. That in the beginning, at least, we, we get find a um, a quiet place to practice. Through solitude of body and mind, no distractions will occur. Therefore, I should forsake the worldly life and completely discard distorted conceptions. So, the other thing which has to be pointed out here before we go any further is who were his audience? They were not all of you people from living from many, many different countries living in Darshan. They were Indian monks living in a monastic college which had many, many thousands of monks and who were dedicated to totally to study and monastic life. This has to be understood, because a lot of what he's going to say will sound very harsh. <coughs> but it's because he's talking to monks. He's not talking to lay people, actually. And he's not talking to women. He's talking to monks. He didn't know that a thousand years later, all these people, all these people from around the world, which he'd never even heard of. Lay people, males, females, would all come to hear his words. So he didn't know that, I don't think, because he centered on who he was talking to. Who he was talking to was a host of monks. Not even monks. There were no mountains. No So, therefore, to say, forsake worldly life 
was easy because they already had forsaken worldly life. Yeah? They were in the monastery. They were in the big monastic college. So that's not difficult for them. Right? I will forsake worldly life and completely discard distorted conceptions. In other words, keep my mind focused, mindful, present, not going off all over the place, just following behind it, swept along by all my thoughts and conceptual thinking, especially disturbed, any thinking or emotions caught up in, in greed or anger or um, envy and jealousy and, and pride and all these, based on this sense of me as being the most important person in the world. All of that we are going to discard. Because what? We're going into the Worldly life is not forsaken. Why? Why don't people go out to practice <coughs> or live in monasteries? Because of our attachment to people. We're attached to our family. We're attached to our, you know, our parents, our wives, our children, our friends. <coughs> and we don't want to leave them. If we leave them, we feel, we feel sad, we feel lonely. And also due to craving for material gain and like. That people think, but if I give everything up, then what will I have? I mean, he's talking to monks. I don't mean that you all have to give up everything, but it's, this chapter is dealing with grasping. And he's saying that we're, we're losing the opportunity to go deeper into the practice. Why? Because of our attachment. Because we, we cling. It's not against kindness and love, but it is against clinging to something and believing that our happiness depends on another. And not recognizing that genuine <coughs> happiness is within us. It doesn't depend on other people. Therefore, I should entirely forsake these things, for this is the way in which the wise behave. We all must remember that the Buddha left before he became a Buddha. He did leave his palace. He left his father, he left his stepmother, especially he left his wife, he left his newborn child, he left all his friends, he left all the ladies of the harem, he left everybody, and he went off. If he had not, we would not be sitting here today. <laughs> and after his enlightenment, he did not go back. Well, he went back just to see them. And in case any of you are wondering, his wife became a nun and eventually an arhat, she became nirvana, and his son likewise. His father was never really reconciled. But there would be no Buddha drama if the Buddha had stayed and been a nice king in his palace. So right from the start, this is not just twenty days off, right from the start, the idea of renouncing family life and going off um, it has been a very much a part of the Buddha Dharma. But even for lay people, to have time away as much as possible, you know, when you have the opportunity, even if it's just a weekend or a week or a month or a year, just to have a break and go in instead of always being interconnected with everyone else is very, very healthy for the mind. To breathe in, as well as bringing out. This is very important. I need a microphone. <laughs> okay. Having understood that disturbing conceptions, disturbing conceptions, <coughs> I assume. I'm looking to see what word it is. Yes. Um, so disturbing conceptions can also be called negative emotions, afflictive emotions, 
or just about anything. They are those emotions like anger, <coughs> greed and craving, envy, jealousy, fear, and our underlying unknowing of how things really are, our basic ignorance, which disturb the mind. Our minds are not peaceful when they are angry. Our minds are not clear when we're full of craving or envy or jealousy. <coughs> and so they, they, they're like waves on the ocean of the mind which stir up the mind. Or like they, if you think of a lake and then you stir it round, then all the mud comes up to the surface and you can't see. <coughs> not only does it... it um, mean that we cannot see down into the depths of the lake, we can only see the surface. But likewise, that is not, because of the waves and the muddy waves which are rolling, it doesn't mirror um, accurately the uh, outer surroundings. It distorts <coughs> everything. So this is why not only do we not see deep, more deeply into our own mind and our own mental and emotional state, but also it distorts what's happening outside and other people. And that's why fundamental problems are what he calls these uh, conceptual distortions, these, these negative, afflictive emotions. In particular, the grasping and greed towards what is pleasurable and the anger and um, aversion towards what seems to us as unpleasurable, all based on the sense of me. So this is very, very step number one Buddhism, right? And in all Buddhist schools, how to deal with our negative emotions based on our fundamental misapprehension of how things really are, is what all our practices are striving to overcome. Having understood that these disturbing conceptions or these uh, afflictive emotions are completely overcome by superior insight and that of the calm abiding, first of all, I should search for calm abiding. And this is achieved through genuine joy of these unattached to worldly life. So in Buddhism, in basic Buddhism, there are two levels of uh, practice of meditation. The first is called shamatha or calm abiding. Calm abiding is in order to get the mind, first of all, quiet down a bit, tamed. The Buddha said we have monkey mind. Sometimes he said mad monkey mind. And here you can understand what he's talking about. Not those nice, poor, apathetic monkeys living in zoos but real monkeys out there. <laughs> well, that's us. That's us in the war when we're not pretending to be nice, well-behaved human beings. That's our mind. What the mind is doing. The body might not be nice. But what is the mind doing? The mind is a little mad monkey. <coughs> so, the first level is to begin to tame the mind. We cannot train the mind until we've tamed it. So the shamatha or calm abiding is to get the mind more quiet, more clear, but especially it is to cultivate the ability to be aware. Because normally we are swept along by our thoughts and feelings like great river. And we're totally immersed in that. And we have no, no distance, we have no clarity of what's actually going on inside us. And so the first step is to cultivate this ability to observe. Which is also called mindfulness. Very, very important. So, in the Buddhist tradition, normally you start by something which is semi-subtle, but not too subtle, which is the breath. 
the breath and the mind are very closely interconnected. The Tibetans say it's like the rider and the horse. So the breath of the horse, the, the mind rides with the horse. So observing the breath as it comes in and out, and not going into a meditation teaching at this point, but first is how to observe the breath. This helps us to develop the ability to be aware, to be mindful. The ordinary mind, our ordinary gross mind, like the waves on the surface of the ocean, is a, just a very gross mind. It's the very most superficial level of our mind. And then there are emotional undercurrents. But still it's a very surface. So then we are trying to develop a more subtle level of consciousness, which we all have, but normally is not very well developed, which is the ability to step back and observe, to witness. And so this is uh, shamatha, that's what it's for, it's to get the mind more quiet, more clear, and more conscious. Then, when the ability to be settled and one-pointed is developed enough and quite effortless, then we turn that attention onto the mind itself. And it said, like someone sitting on the banks of the river, watching the river go by, normally we are swept along by the river. We're completely immersed in the river. Now we're sitting on the bank watching the river, not judging it, not saying, oh, that's a stupid thought, oh, that's a good thought, just, just knowing it. <laughs> right? This is all through shamatha. Sometimes we can even drop the object altogether and just be aware of being aware. It's all shamatha. When that becomes very clear, the ability to observe the mind, step back and witness it. I mean, there are, this is not a meditation course, actually, so I'm not going to go into it. But at a certain point, when we are able to step back and observe the mind, like watching the television, then we can start to analyze the mind. What is a thought? We swim in an ocean of thinking, constantly. Everything we know is our opinion, our thought about it. But what is a thought? I mean, one problem is we believe our thoughts. We think, if I think it, it must be true. Which, when we start to look at the thinking, we realize it's ridiculous. Because what is a thought? It's up and down and it's, where does it come from? Where does it stand? Where does it go to? And then, okay, who is thinking? And then if we say, well, I am thinking, $64,000 question. Oh no. So that, that level of analysis is called Vipassana where we start to think again, that we use our thoughts in order to analyze thoughts and begin to really see what's going on in here. And that, again, leads back into deeper, deeper levels of consciousness. Anyway, this is what he's talking about here. So, um, I should first, I, I have to be, have calm abiding, right? First of all, we have to get the mind centered, clear, aware, present, able to step back and observe. Then, from that, um, we, we can develop um, insight. So, this is the continuing joy of the untouched worldly life. Because of the obsession one transient being has for other transient beings, he will not see his beloved ones again for many thousands of lives. Um, again, you know, we, we, why don't we want to go away and do practice? Because we don't have to leave people we're attached to. 
And so we, we, you know, we hesitate to go away, even for short retreats. Some people find it very difficult to be apart from their, their beloved, even for uh, you know, a few days. But he's saying, well, you know, we feel like this. Oh, I cannot part with you. Oh, even the moment away from you, my heart. <laughs> um, but in fact, once we die, everybody's going to die. They die first, we die first. Who knows who's going to die? But after that, maybe we won't see each other for thousands of lifetimes. You know, I mean, we never know who's going to be together forever. So then what are you going to do? And in the meantime, you know, you have all this pain of attachment. So maybe the problem is the attachment rather than the person. You'll go into this more in a minute. Not seeing them, I am unhappy. And my mind cannot be settled in equipoise. I can't meditate because I'm just thinking, what are they doing? I don't know. I'm not thinking about me. <laughs> I wonder if they're thinking about somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't settle. You know? Even if I see them, there is no satisfaction, and as before, I'm tormented by craving. So, however much we are with someone else, it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, you know, we, we're still agitated in the mind. And so, therefore, he's saying, leave it aside for a bit. Just let it go. Let it go. Calm the mind. Get the mind so that we are able to be present within ourselves under all conditions. And we are not living in this tumultuous <coughs> emotional state. It causes pain and not pleasure. And gets filled with anxiety, grasping, hoping, fearing. There is a level of genuine inner satisfaction far beyond all that, which we can only discover by looking within ourselves. Nobody else can give it to us. Through being attached to living beings, I am completely obscured from the perfect reality my disillusion with psychic existence perishes, and in the end, I'm tortured by sorrow. So we get caught up in our worldly desires and emotions, our appreciation of how unsatisfactory psychic existence, psychic existence is the translation for samsara. Samsara means this realm of constant, it's, it's the opposite of nirvana, of course, but it's not a place, it's a state of mind. And it's when we are totally caught up in our ego, in our grasping and rejection, in our hopes and our fears, and that we think the harder we grasp, the more secure we will be, and not recognizing that the more we grasp, the more troubled we will be. That grasping something which is, it's like a river. You know, everything is impermanent. Everything is changing moment to moment to moment to moment to moment. Outside, inside, our mind, our bodies, other people, all things are impermanent. They are like a river. And so, if we want to grasp the river, hoping to keep it safe, then we grasp, we get the river, and we go like, I've got to keep it. Then we end up with no water. 
if we want to, to take the river and, and appreciate it, we have to cut it and hold it very lightly. And it is thin, it is deep. So the more we grasp, the more insecure we actually are, and the less we get. So this is very important to understand that we should take life with open palms. To being attached, I'm completely obscured. You see, because we're always thinking out, 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 out. We never look within ourselves where perfect reality actually lies. We get caught up in samsara, earning money, having families, getting caught up in all the things which are happening out there. And we forget that essentially samsara doesn't work. Some, one of our nuns said to the English teacher, Samsara is a bad plan. <laughs> yes, Samsara is a bad plan. It doesn't work. And so we need to transform Samsara, but we only transform Samsara from the inside. It's not transforming from the outside. Samsara is our mind. It's not what's happening out there, it's our own mind. By thinking only of them, that's the people we love, are attached to, this life will pass without any meaning. Furthermore, impermanent friends and relatives, and many people like... Huh? Sorry, Mr. Page. Okay, thinking only of them, this life will pass without any meaning. Furthermore, impermanent friends and relatives will destroy even the Dharma, which leads to permanent liberation. So, by getting caught up too much in all our family and friends, and trying to please them, and have them like us, and, and get involved in all their activities, we lose the opportunity for... <coughs> genuine inner practice and then our life has no real meaning at the end of the day we are just wasted the point is that we should try to lead our lives so that at the end of our lives we can die without regret <coughs> feeling I did something meaningful in this lifetime and I benefited myself <coughs> and I benefited others when sometimes, you know, in our nunnery, um, uh, about a couple of hours from here, all the girls are from the Himalayan regions, like Ladakh and Tibet, of course, and Kinur and uh, Nepal and Bhutan and so forth. And when they come, I ask them, why do you want to be a nun? Because they're young, you know, they're usually teenagers just in school. Why do you want to be a nun? <coughs> And again and again, they say, I mean, these are girls 16, 17, 18. They say, I look at my mother, my aunts, my older sisters, and I thought, I don't want that life. I want to do something meaningful with my life, which would benefit myself, benefit others, so that I have done something worthwhile, and I haven't wasted my life. So I want to come here and study down which is amazing for teenage girls. You know, they don't want to go out partying and drinking and smoking and, you know, hanging out. They want to come to a nunnery and study and practice for life. So these young girls are quite intelligent, I think. They've got a good perspective, even though they're so young. They're not forced into a nunnery. You can leave any time you want. It's not a women's prison. <laughs> You're not sentenced. You come here of your own volition. You stay as long as you want. But they're understanding that, you know, there is something more to life than merely, you know, 
getting married, working in the fields, having children. I mean, nothing against any of these things. Depends what you do with your mind while you're doing these things. But for them, of course, they would have. They are not educated enough to be able to uh, study Dharma unless they they renounce the world. And so, therefore, they choose to renounce. Here, you you are all well educated, so you can go to Dharma courses. You can download off the YouTube. You can uh, do retreats from time to time. So total renunciation is not necessary. But nonetheless, from time to time, it's extremely useful. Because we begin to see how much of our time is wasted on things which ultimately have no purpose whatsoever and don't even bring us happiness. So... If I behave the same way as the childish, I shall certainly proceed to the lower realms. And if I am led there by those unequal to the noble ones, where's the use of entrusting myself to the childish? The Buddha called all of us who are not noble ones the childish. In some translations, that is translated as fools, but he doesn't actually say fools. He says the child is the immature. Now, why are we immature? If you look at small children, when they get what they want, all happiness, smiles, dimples. <coughs> when they don't get what they want, then they throw a tantrum. They are so upset, so angry, the world's coming to the end, I didn't get my ice cream. And so this tremendous, you know, and you think, well, natural, because they're children. You know, so naturally children can't, uh, you know, not in control of their emotions. So when things go right, they're happy, happy. When things don't go right, then they're absolutely destroyed. Okay, children. Then we grow up. Our bodies become grown up, then they decay, but inside, we still children. When things go right, happy, happy. When things don't go right, mm, anger, frustration, depression. Things are not working right for me. He said that to me. She left. Me! Ah! But you can't show that. So you don't go, mm. But inside, the little child goes, ah! <laughs> I think next time I don't have that in um, Like that. Do you understand? So we're still little children inside. We think we're all grown up and mature. Not true. Our emotions are those of a three-year-old. And our understanding how all the world revolves around me, 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 my wants, my desires. Just like a child. So Buddha said, we are childish. Society is very childish. It seems to be getting worse. I mean, really. What people look at as entertainment, what people read, what they, they think about, their relationships, becoming less and less mature, more and more childish, more and more self-centered. I mean, you know, um, I think it was Einstein who said, and some years ago, about what he would say now, um, that with the, the modern world has increased greatly in knowledge, but has not increased at all in wisdom. And it's very true. We are very unwise. We know a lot. And yet, the really important things we don't know about it. So, he's saying, if I behave the same way as childish, ordinary, ordinary people, I should certainly proceed to the lower realms. 
And if I'm led by those, what is the use of entrusting myself to the childish? I mean, you know, the Buddha was very insistent that we should be careful of the company we keep. He felt that we are very deeply influenced by the people we hang out with. And therefore, it's very important, as much as possible, of course, we're friendly with everyone, but nonetheless, we should especially associate with good friends. Good friends means people with good, good values. Doesn't mean they have to be Buddhist or Hindu or whatever, but good people, people with good values, because we are influenced by people. And if we are always surrounded by very worldly people with very worldly minds, after a while it begins to rub off. And we find ourselves doing all sorts of things which normally we would never have done if we were left to ourselves. And so therefore it's very important not to associate with the childish. And, and as much as possible, I mean, I have to say, as I say, we're friendly with everybody. But we should hang out with people who have aspirations towards something beyond the merely material satisfactions of this, this daily life. That people who inspire us with their conduct and their speech, and whom we can be open with and discuss things of, which have some genuine meaning, instead of the trivia which most people chatter about, it just disturbs the mind and makes us more distracted from no point. So the Buddha said that good companionship was an essential quality of the path. Good companionship in that when we are meeting with people, we should meet with us as much as possible with people who inspire us towards really um, walking on, on a, a spiritual path and, and not get caught up with people whose minds are looking downwards, but with people whose minds are looking upwards. That's why he started the Sangha. And Sangha doesn't just mean monks. Sangha means the fourfold Sangha of monks, nuns, laymen, lay women. And he always, the Buddha always emphasized how it was very, very important that the fourfold Sangha should be strong, that they should study, practice, propagate the Dharma. Never said just monks. Always the fourfold Sangha. This was very, very important for him right from the beginning of his enlightenment up until the time just before his enlightenment, he emphasized the importance of a well-trained and committed fourfold sangha community. That the community should support each other, take care of each other, help each other, and study practice and disseminate the Dharma as a part of their, their spiritual evolution. So he's talking about childish ordinary people, it means, really. I mean, ordinary people, like us, we're all childish. So that's what he's talking about, us. Don't think, oh, we're just talking about the one over there. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, right. So one moment they are friends, and in the next instant they are enemies. Have you noticed that with married couples? <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. People have been together for 20, 25 years, then they part, and the way one or other or both treat each other, you, you wouldn't do that to your worst enemy. And this is somebody maybe you've had children with, or you've been in partnership with. The way we treat our partners is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Wow. So the people who are the dearest to us, the most beloved, then become the worst of enemies. I mean, this is, he was writing, you know, in the 8th century, but it's still here in the 21st century, more than ever. Oh, human beings. Um, since they become angry, even in joyful situations, it's difficult to please all new people. You know, especially if you're living in very close relationships, it's, you know, it's, it's hard for people to stay in harmony with each other and be kind to each other. They go to Dharma centers and everybody's all sweet and smiles. <laughs> and they go home. 
<laughs> and people who they should be the most kind to are the people they're the most cruel to. You know, really, we, each one of us has this responsibility within our own hearts. How do we treat people who are the closest to us as well as you know, neutral people and people that maybe we don't like them? I mean, this is important. Uh, again and again, I've heard accounts of um, <coughs> women, I mean, uh, Asians and, and Western, whose uh, father, for example, was extremely abusive and would um, you know, beat up the mother and the children, etc. Et but he also went to the temple <laughs> and made offerings to the lamas. And so they all thought he was fantastic. They had no idea of what he did behind closed doors. I mean, I've heard this again and again, but he was some quite well-known people in the drama. Um, like that. You know, we have an outer facade, and then what happens, you know, that's well. But we have to be very, very careful not to associate with that kind of thing. And not to, of course, to propagate it ourselves. We should be kind. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Didn't somebody say? <laughs> well, they are angry when something of benefit is said, and they also turn away from me from what is beneficial. If I do not listen to what they say, they become hang angry and have proceed to the lower realms. So even when you're saying something nice to which is what is going to be helpful, they can get upset. People don't like to be told what to do, so don't tell anybody what to do. I'm telling you, but that's me. Um, in, in general, people do not like to be told. And so they get upset and angry. And they also, um, they don't, I, if I do not listen to what they say, uh, you know, when I tell them something they don't want to hear and they get upset with me for saying that, but then if I don't listen to what they say, then they again get angry and therefore they're making a lot of uh, negative karma and then they're going to go down. I mean, uh, Buddhism is always dealing with um, where one it will be reborn in accordance with one's conduct of body, speech and mind in this lifetime. So if we get upset and angry, even if we're trying to help somebody and that just makes them upset and angry, then it, it causes them to make a lot of negativity and that will, in the next life, create a lot of problems for them. And also in this life. I mean, you know, not just next life, but in this life, if we act like that, we're not going to be happy with the dumbness. We're going to be, you know, have problems. And then we blame other people. But we don't see that other people are really just mirroring what is already in our own hearts. So, you know, we cannot actually help much with other people, but we can do something about ourselves. So, therefore, they are envious of superiors, competitive with equals, arrogant towards inferiors, conceited when praised, and if anything unpleasant is said, they become angry. Oh, there is no benefit derived from the childish. That's it. I mean, he's talking about them, but that's us, right? People are very competitive in this world now. So then people are very envious of people who are better than themselves. They're very competitive with... He's going to deal with this a lot later on, if we ever get to it. Um, and, and very unnice to, to people that they regard as their inferiors towards people who are their employees or their servants or just people in fairly menial tasks. I mean, a lot of people are unbelievably arrogant and nasty. Really quite unbelievable. Again, how mean you can be. I mean, some people are lovely, but a lot of people are not very lovely. And so to see that in not just in other people, but not just in other people, is looking at ourselves. How do we act with people who are our superiors 
compared with how we act with people who we regard as being inferior. And how are we with people where, you know, there's a small space and we all have to share it? So it's not about out there, it's about in here. How are we actually? Look at our own mind, our own attitude. People falling and screaming and smiling to people who are superior to themselves because they hope for advantages. And that they roar out towards people that they think are nobody. We have to look at our own heart. We look at our own heart. All based on ego. All based on me. Me, me, me. He's going to deal with this much more later on. This is just getting you softened up. You wait. <laughs> uh, through associating with the childish, that means ordinary people, including us, they will certainly ensure unwholesomeness, such as praising myself and belittling others, and discussing the joys of psychic existence. So, of course, we are very attracted to samsara because outwardly there are pleasures in samsara. Now, it doesn't mean that you cannot have fun time in samsara, provided we do not clean. So if something nice happens, we don't have to feel guilty about enjoying something nice. As long as when something nice is not happening, we don't care. I think Roberta Curtin said it's like if um, you especially like chocolate cake. And so every time you go to um, you know, a drive-in in America, uh, you ask for chocolate cake, and they give you chocolate cake, and you're happy because you've got chocolate cake. And that's fine. You like chocolate cake, so you eat chocolate cake. But then one day you go there, and they say, no, we, we've sold out chocolate cake, and we've only got carrot cake. Yeah. And then, ah! <laughs> no chocolate cake. I don't like carrot cake. And all this, this, this feeling is coming up. That's the problem. Do you understand? It, it's not... The thing in itself, it's the grasping at the thing and, and the wanting it to be the way I want it to be and the upset when it isn't how I want it to be. That we get all, mm, puts it in a bad mood for the whole day. Why? Yeah, because you couldn't get a shot again. It's so childish. But that's how we are. So to look at that. It's not that, oh, I love chocolate cake, so I'm never going to eat chocolate cake again because I'm a renuncier. <laughs> <laughs> not that. Somebody offers chocolate cake, you like chocolate cake, you're happy. That's not the problem. The problem is when there isn't a chocolate cake, how upset are we or are we not? If we just say, oh, no, never mind, so what? Then there's no problem. But if we are genuinely upset about that, puts it out for the rest of the morning, then there's a problem. You see. I mean, we can get attached to non-attachment. Right? People can be very attached to being out. Anyway. So, um... All right. So if we hang out with, with people who are, have very ordinary materialistic kind of minds, then we kind of absorb their attitudes. And that way we start praising ourselves, putting other people down, just discussing all our sensuous pleasures, and, and not looking at the underside of all this. We get caught up in the superficial. And, and we don't explore any deeper. It's very easy to do that if we are caught up with people whose whole attitude to life is very on the surface. So, to be careful. I should flee away from childish people. When they are encountered, though, I should please them by being happy. I should behave well 
merely out of courtesy, but not become greatly familiar. So again, it doesn't mean that if we meet with people that we, you know, consider to be, you know, rather undeveloped spiritually, <laughs> then we are, you know, are condescendingly, you know, hmm. <laughs> it's not that. We love all people. All beings want happiness. It's going to deal with this later. All beings want happiness and, and want to avoid suffering. Of course they do. And so we love all beings. But because we recognize that at the moment we ourselves are still very immature, we also recognize that we are easily influenced by other people. And therefore we should try as much as possible to be with people who bring out the best in us and not feed into those qualities of the heart which we know need to be transformed. Do you understand? That's the point. So we should be careful as much as possible to be with people that we admire, who we, we feel really have things which we can learn from and their example inspires us and so forth. But of course, I mean, in general, whoever we meet, we recognize that like us, they are suffering. Like us, they would rather be happy. And so, you know, we are genuinely kind and friendly to all beings. But we don't have to become too intimate. In the same way as a bee takes honey from a flower, I should take merely what is necessary for the practice of dharma, but remain unfamiliar, as though I had never seen them before. So he's talking about monks. So monks um, traditionally went on arms around, and they still do in places like Thailand and Burma and sometimes Sri Lanka. In the early, early morning, you see this line of monks going along, holding their begging bowl. The lay people are outside, with pots full of food, and as each monk comes, they drop in a, a spoonful of food to the monk's bowl. And so what he's saying is that you should accept that, like a bee does to the flower. It doesn't harm the flower, it doesn't stay in the flower. It just takes what it needs to pollen from the flower, and then flies <coughs> away. So likewise, um, especially when the, 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 uh, receiving offerings, then one should be grateful, but one shouldn't get attached, and one shouldn't become too familiar. I have much material wealth as well as honor, and many people like me. Nurturing self-importance in this way, I should be terrified after death. So, in other words, you know, if things are going well, and, you know, we have material wealth and, you know, popularity and everything's going nicely. We shouldn't get too caught up in that and, and be attached to that and, and get puffed up by that. That, you know, if this is the result of something, you know, some kind of good karma which one created at some point or other, and that's very nice, but so what? Because in one moment it can change again. And if we get very involved with that and think it's because of our own good qualities, then um, when we die, we could be in trouble. We don't know what's going to happen when we die. And so the best thing we can do is to use our life to some purpose and to create all the, the, the conditions that when we die, we can die without fear because we know we've done the best we can. It doesn't mean that we haven't made mistakes, it doesn't mean that we're all perfect, but it does mean we, we did our bit to try to move along on the path to taming our mind, training and transforming our mind. We've done something in this lifetime which benefited ourselves, naturally, but very much also could benefit others. Then, when we die, we don't have to worry, you know, because we've done the best we can, so then let it go. So, you thoroughly confuse mind 
by piling up whatever objects you are attached to, misery a thousandfold will ensure. So if we spend all our time just accumulating material goods, which we have to leave at the end when we die, everything we have is going to go. Our body is going to go, our relationships are going to go, our material possessions are going, our status is going, our reputation is going, none of this we can take with us. Every single thing will be left behind. Accept. Our karma, the karmic propensities, and our consciousness. That was everything else we leave behind. So we spend our whole lifetime accumulating, 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 and at the end we go forth naked. So what's the point? Well, so our confused mind thinks that by by accumulating more and more and more we will be secure, but we can never be secure because all of us are going to die. I mean, the Buddha says the one thing certain about death is life is death. I mean, nothing else may be, but for sure we're all going to die. That's certain. And when we die, we leave everything behind. So, you know, to spend our whole lifetime accumulating, accumulating, just to leave it for somebody else at the end, what's the point? And in the meantime, we have not gathered, because we're so, being busy, so busy building up material and status and, and, you know, promoting ourselves. The one thing which would have actually helped us when we went, which is all our good karma and the cultivation of the mind and, and genuine insight and realization, that would come with us. That we didn't bother with. And in the meantime, for many, many people, they've done some very dodgy things in order to gain the wealth. And they're going to have to face that next life. So it's very important that they, while we have the opportunity, we don't waste our time and do something worthwhile. Hence, the wise unlike the confused us who, you know, pile up all our possessions. Hence the wise should not be attached because fear is born from attachment. We're so afraid of losing people, things, status, reputation, health. But in the end, everything goes. So if we grasp, there is fear. We hold gently, there is no fear. We allow whatever comes. We accept. The Buddha said the cause of our dukkha, the cause of our suffering and unsatisfaction is clinging. We can't hold, just gently. We think, got to hold tightly. But that holding tightly in itself kills the very thing that we're holding and leads to hope and fear, hope and anxiety, worry, worry, worry. Fear is born from attachment. With a firm mind, understand well that it is in the nature of these things to be discarded. Everything we have, everyone we know, will be left behind. In this lifetime, in future lifetime. Cannot hold on. With everything is impermanent. Everything is flowing, flowing, flowing. I mean, you see a river and you say, oh, that's a river, and you give it a name, and the next day you go and say, oh, yeah, same river, give it the same name. But it's a completely different river. But we don't see that. We don't see that every cell in our body is constantly transforming. And that of others too. And we are transforming our mind, moment to moment to moment. Anyone who has looked at the mind, really watched the mind, who knows that even as you're thinking, well, that's a thought, it's gone. 
Everything is moving, flowing, flowing, flowing. And we want to grasp it. And the very grasping, which we think will therefore bring us security and happiness, is the cause of our suffering. But we don't believe it. We just think if we hold on tight enough, that nothing will change. Because we believe it. We don't see things how they really are. So, there we are. We're stuck here. Um, although I may have much material wealth, be famous, well spoken of, whatever fame and renown I have amassed has no power to accompany me after death. We go into a whole different realm. It's not nothing that we have that we associate ourselves will be taken with us. Except our karma. And that we never gave much thought to. We only were giving thought to our material benefits right here and now. If there is someone who despises me, what pleasure can I have in being praised? And if there is another who praises me, what displeasure can I have in being despised? I mean, why do we care what other people say? I mean, somebody, whoever we are, I'm not very good at this. Um, whoever we are, and especially, you know, people who are well known in the world, there's always going to be people who praise you and there are going to be people who put you down. Of course. What difference does it make? It's always going to be like that. You know, if you know whoever you are, some people will like it, some people won't like it. Thank you, dear. Yes, I would be better. I'm not very good at this. If I had hair, I would be very good at this. Text. I think we're going to have to have two or three um, future sessions with this one. It's not going to, it's going to take time. Um, yes, so whoever we are, there are going to be people who speak well of us and people who speak badly of us. I mean, even a great bodhisattva like his son is the Dalai Lama. Most people here speak very well of him, why not? But, you know, you go across the border to the other place, and, uh, you know, he's a splittist, he's a demon, he's a this, he's a that. You cannot speak his name. He's so reviled. That has nothing to do with him. Which is why he doesn't care. So, if people criticize us, we can look and see, well, is their criticism valid? They say, I like this or like that, is that true? Look, honestly. And if it is true, then we're grateful they pointed it out, because we've not noticed that before, so good. Okay, I'll deal with that. But if we see, well, actually, that's not really true, well, we don't care what they say. And likewise, if people praise us, well, is what they're saying valid? And if it is, well, that's nice, good, keep doing more. And if you can see, that was not my fault. <laughs> If we can see that what they are saying is really just a projection of their own good nature, then we can say, well, that would be nice, but not now. It's not true. But so what? Whether we're praised or whether we're vilified, it's just other people's opinions. It doesn't mean 
we have to look at our own heart and see what is good there, what is not so good, and work on that. Like in a garden. We pull out the weeds, but we also have to water good flowers. So sometimes if people say nice things about us, and we look and we can see, yeah, actually that's, that's true, then that's an encouragement to do even better. I mean, we don't just pull out the weeds, we also have to water the good flowers and put them in the sun and encourage them, as the Buddha said. So it's not that we only have to, you know, be concerned when people say bad things about us. You know, we also are, you know, listen to what any, if people say things, we recognize most of what people say is just their projection. Either of their good heart, or of their envy, or jealousy, or misconception. And we don't know, but we can look first and see, is it true? If it's true, okay. If it's not true, then who cares anyway? So we shouldn't be so concerned with what other people say. People are always going to say anything, God I You know? It doesn't matter. Who cares? We have to be true to ourselves. That's the important thing. Not worry what other people say. So, even if the conqueror was unable to please the various inclinations of different pe- beings, then what need to mention an evil person such as I? Therefore, I should give up the intention to associate with the worldly. The Buddha had many critics, and his, um, his what was he? He was his cousin, Devadatta on many occasions tried to kill the Buddha because he was very envious of him. And also there are accounts of him meeting with uh, like Brahmins who, you know, when he was on arms round and they would say, why should I give to you? You don't work. Here I am working in my field and then I eat the result of my own labors. You're doing absolutely nothing and you're just useless, you know, parasite of society, so why should I give anything to you? I mean, they said that even to the Buddha. And the Buddha did. Buddha said some interesting things as a result. One of the things he said was, okay, well, if we throw a, a clump of mud at someone else, that mud may hit them or it may not, but meantime your own hands are dirty. <laughs> He also said, if we offer a gift to someone and they do not accept it, to whom does the gift belong? And they said, well, to the giver. And he said, okay, I do not accept your criticism. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So like that, you know, we don't have to um, be upset or exalted by other people's opinions. It's not the point. We look into our own heart and access what is there in our own heart, recognizing all our faults and also appreciating any good qualities we might have which are helpful for beings, but without getting, you know, extraordinarily depressed or exalted because there's always so much more work to do. Projections are always a difficulty, you know. People project so much. Often, you know, beyond anything. I mean, I can see very well because people talk to me and I... No, you know, that's really... I mean, you know, they, they see all these sort of incredible qualities which I can say I don't have at all. And they probably do. And so they're projecting their good qualities onto me and seeing that as a reflection and believing that's what they're seeing. Actually, they're just looking into a mirror of their own mind. And you can see that also uh, with how they relate to mamas sometimes. You know, really a lot of it is just projection. Some good projections, some not so useful. Um, so, right. So, therefore, I should give up the intention to associate with the worldly because, you know, they, they're very difficult to please. 
they form those who have no material gain and say bad things about those who do. Have you noticed? People are very dismissive of the poor, but at the same time they're very critical and envious of those who have wealth. I mean, you can't please anybody. Right? So they look down on the poor and they, they are envious of the wealthy and critical. And so whether we have much or we have little, somebody is going to complain about it. <coughs> How can they, who by nature are so hard to get along with, ever derive any pleasure from me? Where it keeps thinking, well, I don't have to stay with these people because honestly and truthfully, whatever you do, it's going to upset them. And so I have no reason why I shouldn't go off into solitude. He's talking about renunciation. So whatever we do, we're going to please some people and displease others. And you, who can ever please everybody? It just isn't possible. Even the Buddha couldn't do that. It has been said by the Tathagata, Tathagata is the Buddha, that one should not befriend the childish, because unless they get their own way, these children are never happy. So if you think of children, we know that unless they get their own way, they scream and shout and get upset. And, and, and as I said, you know, we are all children, only we now have old bodies. But inside, we are still very much children. We are happy, happy when things go right. We get upset, annoyed, frustrated, angry, <laughs> irritated. Ah. When things don't go the way I want them to go, people don't do what I want them to do. People don't say what I would like them to say. Then, we're little children. You get upset. But the problem is that things are never always going to go our own way. And, you know, we cannot always do the things which other people would want us to do. And so, like children, they're going to get upset because we can never please everybody all the time. It just isn't possible. And then they get upset, and then they get angry, and then they, you know, create all these frictions in relationships, in families, in the workplace, in communities. The Buddha talked a lot about harmony in community. A lot of the monastic code of Vinaya is dealing with how to live together in harmony because it's quite difficult with so many little egos all together uh, that every ego is going to be satisfied. Because, you know, some things go the way I want them to go, but other things don't go the way I want them to go, and then we are upset, and then we blame others, and we think everything should be done the way I want it to be done. And uh, so, therefore, there is a lot of conflict in communities. And you know, this is one of the problems in, in, you know, in ashrams, in monasteries, in any Dharma community. Most of the problems are just caused by the ego of the beings inhabiting that ashram or monastery or Dharma center, when you look at it. Because everybody will be happy if only things go the way I want them to go. How can other people want to do it that way? When it's obvious we should be doing it this way. Any idiot could see that. What's the matter with me? Just do it the way I want to do it. Everything will be fine. So then if you've got all these little egos all wanting it the way they want it to be done, it's very hard. Even in monastic communities, you know, to keep harmony. So he's talking about this. He's trying to encourage us to think. <sighs> he lived in a, a, in a monastery, you understand. He was living in a monastery thousands and thousands of months, so he must be speaking from the heart. 
He knows what he's talking about. Right, so then, when shall I come to dwell in forests, among the deer, the birds, the trees, that say nothing unpleasant, and that are delightful to associate with? <sighs> Get away from all these monks. <laughs> So he's going to now tell us how wonderful it is to go away and to... Of course, India in those days, you know, this is more than a thousand years ago, was full of forests. I mean, nowadays we know when you go to Bihar or Jharkhand or UP, etc., the places where these great Buddhist institutes were, I mean, they are really, really very difficult places. And the towns, likewise, are very difficult. There's a big discrepancy between the wealthy and the poor. And um, most of India's problems are out there on the street. But that was not like that in his day. In his day, much of India and most parts were covered in jungles, in forests. The towns were small, and um, the you know, there were monasteries and ashrams, and it was, um, I, I mean, despite the disease and the low birth rate and everything, but still, it was probably a much easier place, but still, it was not so. But when he talks about going out, he, it's very easy. He would just have to walk out the monastery and walk a few miles and you're out there. Not now. Now you have, you know, four lane highways and traffic and, but in those days, of course, you know, there was no vehicles and the towns were small and uh, most of India was uh, relatively uninhabited. So he's thinking that, like that to walk out from the monastery and go and stay in retreat. When dwelling in caves, in empty shrines, and at the feet of trees, never look back. Cultivate detachment. When shall I come to dwell in places not clung to as mine, which are by nature wide and open, and where I may behave as I wish without attachment? When shall I come to live without fear, having just a begging bowl and a few odd things, wearing clothes that are not wanted by anyone, and not even having to hide this body. Having departed to the cemeteries, when shall I come to understand that this body of mine and the skeletons of others are equal in being subject to decay? Now, in those days, uh, apparently from other sources likewise, uh, many bodies were not cremated, and of course they were not buried. Um, they were just left out in the open, and then they were devoured by um, the animals that lived in those, um, you know, around the cemeteries. As, of course, in Tibet, likewise, um, because in Tibet, the land most of the time was frozen solid, so you couldn't bury people. And in Tibet, they didn't have much wood. Wood was very precious, so therefore they didn't burn people, because it takes a tremendous amount of wood to burn one corpse. Uh, therefore, in Tibet, the, the custom was to cut people up in certain high hills. They would take the body up, it would be cut into pieces, and, and the bones ground with sampa, and then uh, the vultures would uh, devour it. And this was considered to be very meritorious because you were making your last uh, offering of generosity uh, to help feed the birds. But it seems that even in India, despite the fact they had a lot of wood, because they had all these jungles and forests, <coughs> nonetheless, it seems to have been the custom to often just abandon the, the corpses there. In the tantras, you, you often hear about people going and meditating in the cemeteries with the corpses. Um, because apparently they didn't often, unless you were presumably very wealthy or important, uh, bother to uh, burn the corpse. 
Maybe many people died. I don't know why they didn't burn, because they had lots of wood. But they didn't. And so this was also in early Buddhist texts. You could go and contemplate the decomposition of the corpses. Uh, as a way of referring, you know, just as this body is, you know, of this, you know, after one or two days in a tropical country, the body is no longer an object of desire. He's going to be dealing with this. And so if you want to develop genuine renunciation towards the body, uh, you are encouraged to go to cemeteries. It's not like cemeteries in the West, where you have nice little tombstones and stone angels and things like that. Not like that. They were very fearsome places and uh, also considered to be the haunt of uh, ghosts and ghouls. Um, so later also in the Tibetan tradition, uh, because of this 11th century great scholar and yogi called Magic Labyrinth, uh, they have this uh, practice called Chur, and that uh, where you call up you visualize your body being cut up and, and cooked, and at the same time you call in all the ghosts and ghouls to come and eat. And uh, this was supposed to be uh, practiced in uh, one of these uh, cemeteries, because uh, it, they're very terrifying places, especially in the middle of the night. And if you have a strong belief in ghosts and ghouls and demons, the last thing you want to do is to call them to come and eat you. So uh, to do this uh, is, uh, you know, brings up a lot of fear and is therefore called cutting the ego. But um, also in all the, from early Buddhism where you would go to a cemetery to watch, observe the, the decomposition of the corpse and the skeletons, and also in the tantric schools where you also went to cemeteries to uh, practice. Uh, cemeteries in India and in Tibet were quite uh, alarming places. And um, it took a lot of courage to um, be there, especially uh, at night, and, and contemplate the body. So, he says, um, Having departed to the cemeteries, when shall I come to understand that this body of mine and the skeletons of others are equal in being subject to decay? Then, because of its odor, not even foxes will come close to this body of mine, for this is what will become of it. I mean, he's going to go on later about the unpleasant aspects of the body, but it's in order to help us to generate a certain detachment to the body. He's going to go on about this a lot later, especially dealing with the opposite sex and our attraction to the bodies of others. But it also includes our own body, that we think we're, you know, we, every day we, we, we shower, and, uh, you know, keep our hair all nice and clean and put on clean clothes. And some people perfume themselves and make themselves look beautiful and make themselves all look lovely. But actually, it's like a silk bag. Looks very beautiful silk bag full of offal and... Uh, you know, I mean, if you, if you undo the skin, we have a saying, you know, in English, beauty is only skin deep. But we don't believe it. But if you think about it, if we peeled off the skin, then what have you got underneath? You know, I mean, all the things in our, our brain, our heart, our lungs, our intestines, our liver, our kidneys, uh, are they really cuddly? <laughs> And everything which we take into the body, the most delicious food, comes out as, you know, feces, urine, sweat, vomit, none of it is attractive. And so he's going to be dealing with this. It's in order to make us recognize that what are we attached to is really only skin deep. 
So once the body begins to decay, even foxes won't come near. And he's thinking, you know, like my body is like that also. You know, after a day or two, especially in a topic, nobody will want to come near. You know, we ourselves wouldn't want to come near to ourselves at that point. We stink. And we've got a horrible color, and we look awful. Who wants anything to do with that? Although this body arose as one thing, the bones and flesh with which it was created will break up and separate. So how much more so will friends and others? We're going to be separated even from our own body. We're so attached to our body and so identified with our body that if we think about it, what's there to be attached to? So we don't think about it. Because to think about it would make us really oh dear. So we prefer to cover that over. We don't think about, what does this mean? We're all walking corpses. So this is my body. What to speak of the body of others? At birth, I was born alone, and at death too, I shall die alone. As this pain of being born and dying cannot be shared by others, what use are obstacle-making friends? At the time when we really need people, like when we're being born, when we're dying, who can help us? In the meantime, if we get too involved with all our friends, especially very worldly friends, then they will be an obstacle to our own spiritual journey. They will be a distraction for us. And then we will waste our time. And when the time comes to die, we, and we have to leave everybody behind, we will wonder, well, what was all that about? We don't think about it. We put it all aside. But, you know, he's really looking at how things really are. On a, a relative level. It's not the ultimate level, but it's a relative level. Then, you know, this is who we are. We are all bound to decay. We're all bound to die. And no one can help us with that. In the same way as travelers on a highway leave one place and reach another, likewise, those traveling on the path of conditioned existence, that means samsara, here and now, leave one birth and reach another. So sometimes the, the body is compared to a guest house. We stay in a hotel room for a time, and it might be a nice hotel room, or it might be a funky hotel room, but we don't attach to that because we know it's only a hotel. And we're on a journey, so we're going to leave that hotel room behind and then eventually go to another hotel room. So however the hotel may be, we take care of it and we don't trash it. But at the same time, it's not me and mine. It's just a temporary accommodation. Which, you know, we try to, you know, I mean, it's not good to trash hotel rooms. <laughs> Management won't appreciate that. But beyond that, it's, you know, it's not, you know, we don't associate ourselves with it. We don't identify ourselves with it. Because it's only a hotel. Not my hotel. It's a hotel room. It's useful. We can make use of it. It has all the, you know, things we need. But, you know, we're not clinging to it. Because we know we have to leave it behind and go on. Until the time comes for this body to be supported by four pole bearers, that means, you know, we're dying, dead, while the world is standing around stricken with grief, until then, I shall retire to the forest. So he's saying, until I die, 
And everybody is, oh, he was such a nice monk. Oh, look at him. Until then, he's going to go. He didn't find something, but he was, his aspiration was to go. Leave the monastery, go off into the forest. Befriending no one and begrudging no one, my body will dwell alone in solitude. If I am already counted as a dead man, when I die, there will be no mourners. Nilarepa, the great Tibetan yogi, made the same aspiration that he always prayed that he would die alone in his cave without anyone to grieve him, that he would just be by himself. And I think that's, I mean, if you're into practice, actually, you would want that. Or oh, else a nice, useful llama sitting nearby to help. That, that's super best. <coughs> But what you don't want is lots of people crying and saying, oh, don't leave us, how can you leave us, oh, please stay. It's the last thing you need when you're dying. So if you're ever with people who are dying, please encourage them. Don't ask them to stay. Just really tell them to, whatever they believe in, to think of it at that time, if they have some spiritual belief, they don't, then just think, advise them to look to the light. But don't ever ask them, oh, don't leave us, how can you leave us? That's a very not good thing to say to people. It creates a lot of uh, obstacles in their journey forward. Befriending the ones, as there will be no one around to disturb me with their mourning, thus there will be no one to distract me from my recollection of the Buddha. So that's the point. He wants to die alone so that he can keep his mind focused on his object of devotion, which in this case would be the Buddha. Whatever is your object of devotion, keep your mind on that. Don't get distracted by family and friends. This is a time to leave that behind. And family and friends, if you know someone's particular object of devotion, help them with that. Encourage them with that. Have a recording of something of that. You know, if whatever they're, they're, don't try to make them believe what you believe. But whatever they believe, help them and encourage them at that time to stay focused on that. And not to distract them in any way. Keep their mind focused on something beyond themselves, higher than themselves. Uh, so, so he said, I will be counted as a dead man, and when I die, there will be no mourners. And as there will be no one around to disturb me in their mornings, and no one to distract me. Therefore, I shall dwell alone, happy and contented, with few difficulties, in a very joyful and beautiful forest, pacifying all distractions. Having given up all other intentions, being motivated by only one thought, I shall strive to settle my mind in equipoise by means of calm abiding shamatha and then subdue the mind with vipassana. So this is his desire. Both in this world and the next, desires give rise to great misfortune. And so he's going on next to how to overcome desire. Um, but first, you uh, to to really do um, to really uh, get the most from our practice. It is very helpful to be in a conducive environment. Doesn't necessarily mean we have to be alone, as he is specifying here. Group meditations. I, in fact, when people say they want to go off and do, they have these fantasies. Um, solitary meditation in some cave in the Himalayas. I say, oh, forget that. Um, how much meditation have you done so far? And usually it's not too much. So I say, well, first you join groups where there is a good instruction and guidance and learn how to meditate. And then once you are really confident in the method and when things come up, you have had your doubts resolved, 
then you can think about going off somewhere and doing practice by yourself. But in the beginning, we, in itself, just being alone is not going to solve the problem if we don't know what we're doing. And when doubts come up, we have no one to ask. So it's much, much better to do uh, group retreats with a good teacher, because also you get group energy, you know, and, and so we learn discipline. I mean, if one's all by oneself and one is not disciplined, then, oh, my mind is so crazy this morning, oh, maybe, well, it's time for coffee. And that we get, and that's it. But if you're with a group, you may be thinking, oh, God, I'd love a cup of coffee. But there's nothing you can do, you have to sit there. <laughs> And so we learn discipline, and if you have a good teacher, then they are taking you by the hand and leading you step by step by step, so you have confidence. And you have the group energy. And even though you might look around and everybody else is in samadhi, and I mean you have a, a difficult mind, never mind, you still have to sit there. So in this way, it, it's actually in the beginning, it, it's much, usually much more beneficial to do a, a group retreat. And uh, that gives us all the qualities which we need to later be able to go on and do a solitary retreat if we want to. I mean, many, like in Zen, for example, usually they always do group retreats. Even when they're very advanced in their practice, they, they, they meditate as, as a, a sangha. Uh, so it's not that one is better than the other, but sometimes people like at certain times to test themselves by um, going into solitude and to um, see if they really understood the, the method so that it can be helpful. As he said, to be in a place where you are not distracted by other people, that you know the animals around are not usually a distraction, maybe some barking dogs might be. But um, normally, you know, if you're by yourself, then you only have yourself to deal with, and that's enough trouble. So, um, in that way, it can be very, um, very encouraging sometimes to be completely by oneself and self-reliant. No, no one to turn to if things are difficult, if problems come, we have to look only to ourselves. So that also is useful. But in the beginning, uh, it's better to have expert guidance, and uh, then we know where we're going, and we can walk with confidence. So thank you very much. We will continue with this <coughs> at 3 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> at 3 o'clock. Thank <laughs> you.